Welcome to the Delight in the Limelight live stream show. I'm your host, Linda Ugalo. I'm a speaking confidence coach and author of the book, Delight in the Limelight. I'm here and I bring on guests here to help you enjoy the speaking that you do. Go from dread to loving it instead, whether that's on stage, on camera, in the media or the meeting room. And today we're going to be talking about the meeting room. Before we get going with our guest today, I want to let you know that I have a checklist of preparation rituals that you can use before you speak in order to feel grounded and focused and present. And you can get that at lindayugalo.com forward slash rituals. And I will put that in the show notes for you. So here we're talking today about conflict and how to change it also from something you dread or try to avoid into something that well, maybe not loving it, you know, instead, but at least making it something that is more productive. And here to help us reframe the whole idea of conflict and how it can work for you is Leanne Davey. With her PhD in organizational psychology, she uses her deep insight to help teams and organizations get the most from their collaborations and efforts. Her mission is to radically transform the way we communicate connect and contribute. I love alliteration. <laughs> Me too. Communicate, connect and contribute so we can achieve amazing things together. And isn't that what we're after, after all? So Leanne is also a best-selling author in her latest book, The Good Fight is Fantastic. Use productive conflict to get your team and organization back on track. Welcome, Leanne. Thanks, Linda. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited too. I'm so, I can't express to you because this, the whole idea of conflict and dealing with conflict and being conflict avoidant and myself and being a peacemaker has, has nagged me for most of my life. And I think probably a lot of people have that experience. And I've been waiting for someone like you to, <laughs> to come in and show me how to handle it with more more grace and equanimity. So I appreciate all that you put into your fantastic book. I I think anyone who comes on here, if you haven't gotten it yet, you got to go out and get this book because it's gonna it's gonna change the way you you look at conflict. So I want to start with chapter eight, actually, because in chapter eight, you you give us I love chapter eight. You picked my favorite chapter. Really? Yeah. Really? Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> well, what I love about it is the metaphors that you describe about how we tend to look at conflict and how we can look at it in a different way. And it's very visual. So I want you to talk about the crew boat and the tarp. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, one of the things that makes, if you want to set Leanne off and really get me angry, it's uh, with all of the language and imagery and metaphor for teamwork, which seems to be about rowing. <laughs> so many people have seen those successories posters with the like, the crew rowing on the the calm water and the synchronized ripples i'm like i don't know what team you're on i was never on a team that was like that and the the language of that is you know we're all in the same boat don't rock the boat we should all be pulling in the same direction and everything that rowing as a metaphor gives us is don't fight against the way the team is going and you know, what a harmful thing to say. We are not on teams because we're all pulling in the same direction. We're on teams to actually bring our unique perspective to represent different stakeholders. So I went searching for what's a better metaphor. And what I came with, up with is uh, not a better metaphor. It's a silly, silly metaphor, but somehow it's sticky. And it comes from a time many years ago when my husband and I took our girls camping and we we're having a lovely time. And then in comes this big rainstorm. And I'm looking at this little rain fly on our cheap tent and thinking, well, this isn't going to go well. So we went into the nearest town and bought a big plastic tarp as well. Big. We went looking for a big plastic tarp. And all we found was one sad little tarp left that had been returned, folded into its package. And it was, you know, barely the size of the tent. We bought it. We brought it back to the campsite, tied ropes in each of the four corners and, and got to work trying to do two things. Take the scarce resource, this small tarp, 
try and cover as much of the tent as we could. And then secondly, it was already raining by this point. The rain was coming down at a bit of an angle. So we were trying to kind of get the optimal spot to keep us dry. And as this was happening, my husband started pulling a little too hard on his trying to really trying to make sure it was tight. But of course, our five year old at the time was opposite to him. And he pulled so hard, he pulled the whole tarp off the tent and left her face down in the mud puddle. <laughs> and while we finally got her cleaned up and, and back pulling again, the nine-year-old at this point rolls her eyes and lets go. And the corner of the tarp comes flying up. The tent is getting soaked. And this all of a sudden was, okay, this, this is the metaphor. So when we are in a team, we have scarce resources, always not enough money, not enough time. Uh, we always have a tarp that's too small, um, but we're not pulling in the same direction to really optimize those resources. We're doing our own jobs, playing our own parts um, and trying to balance off so that we optimize the decision and keep all those stakeholders, whether they be shareholders or customers uh, who are in the tent dry. And so this silly, silly story has become the basis of an exercise. I didn't tell the story in the article, but I published the exercise in Harvard Business Review and it's become very useful. So what we do is we just say, all right, what rope are you pulling? And that's really a way of saying, what's the unique value you bring to your team? So if you're the salesperson, you're thinking about customers and the market and all those sorts of things. Um, if you're the operations person, you're thinking about process and efficiency and that sort of thing. So what's the unique role? Who that's not in the room are you fighting for? And, and what you'll find when you do this exercise is that you're probably fighting for somebody different who's not in the room than the person across the table from you. And so the last question is just, therefore, what what do you need to fight for? What is the tension you need to put on the conversation? So this getting away from, we all need to pull in the same direction and getting into a no. What we need to do is understand our obligation to conflict, know what we're fighting for, and take these scarce resources and with different perspectives and, and empathy and understanding and, and really good deliberation to kind of get to the optimal decision to keep everybody sleeping in the tent dry. So that that's been a fun exercise and story to play with. Yeah. Yes. And it and it's very helpful because it gets it creates a different picture of what what it we are doing as a team you know as you say we have different functions we have different yeah. perspectives we have different needs in fact with with today's attention on diversity mm -hmm. and diversity of, of all kinds, all kinds. Yeah. of, per, of mm -hmm. perspective as yeah. well as you know um the people who are who are in the company when you have different perspectives you have different perspectives so we're kind of like we're we're asking for it but we don't have the tools to handle yeah it yeah and we don't have the the conversation scaffolding we don't have the structure to know and so one of the things we love about this exercise is then people actually go seeking out oh we haven't heard you know nobody's pulled this rope yet and instead of being frustrated and annoyed and experiencing that as friction once you understand that that's tension that you need to deliberate effectively, you go seeking it out. It completely turns conflict on its head. We haven't had enough yet. We haven't heard from this perspective. Yeah, so it's, it is quite magical when we do this exercise. I, so I just want to like point out what you just said is we haven't had enough yet. Like you are known for saying we need more conflict. <laughs> yes. And what you're, what you're, you're not saying we need to argue more. Right. We're, you're saying something else. You are saying. Yeah. So um, people ask me all the time, what's the difference between healthy and unhealthy conflict? So, uh, you know, trying to keep my metaphors per minute rate nice and high, I'm going to say uh, healthy conflict for me is tension, that tarp metaphor. And so I talk about it. It's still uncomfortable. So at no point am I saying that conflict, even if it's healthy conflict, is comfortable. It's not. And that's why I use the word conflict. A lot of people are like, could we just, you know, call it a discussion? I'm like, well, that doesn't give the, the appropriate mindset. This is going to be uncomfortable, but it's worth it. So the metaphor I use for healthy tension is like yoga. So mm -hmm. yoga, it's a stretch and it is uncomfortable, but you know, it's uncomfortable in the service of better agility, you know, becoming stronger, all of those things. So that's 
healthy conflict. Tension should feel like doing yoga, not comfy, but feels great afterward. On the other side, unhealthy conflict feels like friction. It feels like nobody's listening. We're not getting anywhere. We're getting slower instead of faster. And I equate that to having a blister. Mm. And there is nothing good about a blister. <laughs> it's excruciating. It slows you down. It doesn't feel better after it's still there rubbing away. So that's how I think about it. So what I'm advocating for is way more tension, way more tension. Our teams have absolutely insufficient tension. We don't like it. We avoid it. And then as little friction as possible. And if we can complete, we have lots of friction right now and little tension. We, we want to change that balance. Lots of tension, little friction. That's yeah. What's well, interesting, you know, I'm, I'm a dancer in my background and I use, and dance therapy and I use movement as a way for, to develop like leadership even. And the idea of the tension, there's connection there. There's, you're feeling it. The, you, in order to, it's like you said, if you let go, then the other person goes f flying. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's about feeling into that yeah. and, and not shying away from it, but it's a kind of engagement and you using it, right? Like it, that yeah. creates interest in the partnership in dance, yeah. right? My yeah. daughter's a contemporary dancer and, and, you know, watching how they partner and use that tension that that's how they stay up. Right. right. Exactly. It, right? Yeah. That's, that's right. So it, it's kind of like, um, fine. I mean, you you talk a lot about changing the, the mindsets and we, we, and that's what we're talking about now is like, how do yeah. you get into that mindset? But I think in order to, to think about switching your mindset, you have to figure out, well, what mindset do I have right now? And what I love in your chapter three <laughs> is how you talk about the messages that we've absorbed. And you talk about three particular messages that influence how we view conflict and that may be at work in our subconscious mind. And I think it's so important that you bring it up early on in, in the book, because I, I do the same in my book, Delight in the Limelight. I like to get to the root cause because <laughs> yeah. unless you know what the root cause is, you will act it out. You, yeah. you, you have to bring it up to the light and look at it in order yeah, to round again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about the three different messages that you find hinder us from productive conflict. Yeah. There's so I, I, since I wrote the book, I've actually learned a couple new things, which I'd love to add because I think they're really fun. So when people talk about, you know, why am I conflict avoidant? I, I learned a new piece of information from Margaret Mead, the anthropologist reading her work. And they asked about where was this first evidence that humans, you know, cooperated and collaborated um, as a way of us evolving and surviving. She said, well, it comes from a 15,000 year old femur bone where they have evidence that the femur fully broke and fully healed. She said, so that means 15,000 years ago, there was somebody at least six weeks where that person was protected by other people, where other people got them food and all those sorts of things. So if you're conflict avoidant, like I am, I always say, like, cut yourself some slack. If 15,000 years of evolution has made you conflict avoidant, because that's that was our advantage in the animal kingdom was that we were harmonious and got along and cooperated. So that was interesting. The, the stuff I'm very, I talk about in the book is, you know, from the time we're born and our socialization and the messages we get around conflict, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Um, that's a big one. You should just like smile. And, and I'm Canadian. So this, like this passive aggressiveness is our national, like this is our national pastime. Um, I used to say, my, my grandma would say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. But of course in Canada, it's really, if you can't say anything nice, wait till we're in the car. Uh, like it's, it's a passive aggressiveness. Um, there are, um, I think the other big one is we get a lot of mind your own business. Don't get involved. Uh, we get fearing power, like be good and stay out of trouble, all of those sorts of things. So we have a lot of baggage that uh, makes us conflict averse. So if it's not bad enough that we've got 15,000 years of evolution doing this, we also in our life and then come into organizations and people have brass plaques of values on the wall and it says teamwork and somehow teamwork is those rowers 
And so people are, you know, you get 360 feedback. Leanne's a little too direct, or right? So there's so much coming at us that that makes us conflict avoidant. It's it's a big issue. It's a big problem. And it's a lifetime of work for me. I am naturally very conflict avoidant. I'm not good at it. Um, so it's it is a practice like yoga for me, trying to be better at it. Uh from reading your book, it doesn't feel like you avoid it. It feels like you bring a sense of curiosity. Oh, well, that's what I'm working on. So, you know, I always say that, you know, just count on me to make all the mistakes in life that I can then write about and try and help other people. So yes. everything in the book is a mistake I made. So, you know, my favorite part of the book was deciding to write the try this at home bonus chapter, which when I, I drafted it, it started with a scene of my husband and me in the psychologist's office having marital therapy. And I wrote the draft and I showed it to him like, how do you feel about me publishing? <laughs> and he was like, yep, go for it. I was like, thank you. Um, so, you know, it really is for me having made the mistakes. I think for the most part, I'm kind to myself about the mistakes and that allows you to then be curious about how do I do better and, and that sort of thing. So, but I, every single person listening who's thinking, Ooh, I, I'm like, I'm with you. <laughs> I still think, Ooh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. I know that for, for many years, I, I had difficulty even having simple conversations with people who didn't share my views. Yeah. It, I find it, that's getting hard again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is yeah. getting hard again. Yeah. So I, I just want to point out that about these messages, one way that I have found helpful to handle what these messages were is that we're, we're in a process through our culture, you know, we're evolving, mm -hmm. you know, things that were of the norm 50 years ago are no longer, yeah. we've got new norms. And there has been an evolution, I think, of uh, consciousness and awareness and mindfulness. And I feel that like with all those messages, like if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. I sort of feel that must have been in a movie or something. And everybody picked up on it. It and, was in the zeitgeist, wasn't it? Just really, right. Maybe it, kind it of was. a 50s Pleasantville zeitgeist or something. Right. And yeah. so it's not like it's a bad thing, but it's just limited and it's misguided in its impact. Because people were, you know, it is, I do value kindness. Yeah, As I know you do I too. Do. I just so, do that. Yeah. So, so if you have to say something not nice, say it kindly. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I love your distinction in the book about that this, it is kind to speak up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Abs and it's, um, so uh, my friend, Stephen Chudletsky has a book coming out called Speak Up. And he's talking about in organizations, the risk, the first chapter is really exciting because it gets into the Boeing 787 Max uh, story of what happens when that, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, becomes an organizational crisis that leads to loss of life. And, and that sort of thing, we know that's how I first got into industrial organizational psychology. I was a second year undergraduate student and I, I lucked into a class uh, on IO psychology and we were studying this space shuttle challenger disaster. And how, how did people in NASA know that those O-rings were not safe and that space shuttle still take off on the launch pad that morning, right? So, uh, you know, when you get to speak up, um, and Stephen's book really pulls this out, um, if we aren't good at conflict, the stakes can be extremely high, extremely yes. high. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, by the way, I am going to have uh, Stephen or Shed. Shed, yeah. Show. Coming up. Yeah. So I've, we can. I, I've known Shed since he was 21, since before he was Shed. So I, he's still Stephen to me, but yeah, I should. Shed, yes. Yeah. He's going to be on the show. That's amazing. Yes. Yes. I, I don't have my calendar in front of me, <laughs> but soon. Keep your eyes open for that. And I want to uh, circle back to like these, these three mindsets. One is um, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything uh, at all. The second one is don't butt into other people's business. And I, what I appreciate about this is that I think a lot of people do see conflict. We see bullying, let's say in school, or we see kids, other kids doing things we're not comfortable with. We don't say anything because we don't have the words to say it. Mm -hmm. 
The bullying is a great example. So in my um, private time, I'm on the board of a children's mental health charity. So we've been following the bullying research. And it turns out that, um, of course, bullying is not really about the bully or the bullied. It's about the bystander. Um, and without the bystander to, you know, become aroused and, and give feedback to the bully, it, bullying doesn't happen. And so Deb Pepler does this amazing research where they actually had cameras on school playgrounds so they could monitor these things. And it turns out if, if somebody says something as simple as don't do that, um, bullying, I think it was like 76% of bullying episodes are done within 15 seconds. If somebody is willing to just say, don't do that. Like it, you don't even have to have fancy words. <laughs> you just have to like, no, stop. Um, but we just are so socialized to, to stay out of it, to try and stay safe, to um, so there's such an opportunity to do a better job. So with that issue of mind your own business, I just say, what does it say on your business card? And what does it say on theirs? Looks to me like it is your business. <laughs> so get involved. That's right. You're in the same yeah. business. Yes, I like that. I love that. Yeah. We work for the same company. It is my business. My business. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and the third piece that you, you talk about in that chapter, um, is the new mindset chapter three. What chapter is that? I can't remember. That's Whatever. It's, yeah. It's that it's around there. It could yeah, be the yeah. following one. Uh is about how we handle emotions or yeah, how well, we think great. about emotions. Say more about that. So I think one of the other things that really holds us back from having productive conflict is we fear, and, and I used to talk about it always as we fear making somebody else emotional. I think increasingly now, as we're just so stressed out and burned out, we're also worried about saying something, making ourselves emotional. So um, I, was doing a, I was doing a session on feedback for a big accountancy yesterday. And somebody said, said, you know, okay, but what if people get emotional? I said, can we just, I have lots of tips and tactics and strategies, but can we just stop for a moment and say that the people who I can guarantee you will not get emotional at work are the people who don't care. So can we just start by saying, if somebody gets emotional at work, can we change our mindset? Okay. They obviously care about this enough that it's upsetting them. You know what? These, this day and age, good. Because Gallup keeps telling us how people are less and less engaged. If you're disengaged, you're not getting emotional about getting feedback. So I think we need to first just say emotions are how our body works. We know that we learn more when things are emotionally salient. Our memory kicks in more effectively when things are emotional. So we're built um, to use emotions as a tool. So let's stop talking about somebody getting emotional as unprofessional or whatever we think. Um, so if we can start there, and then we can say, the other thing that I think folks get wrong is that they think the emotion is the issue. And the emotion is never the issue. So I say, think about emotion kind of like pain. So it's a symptom of an injury, but it's not the injury. And I think for a lot of folks, especially in leadership management people, they think the emotion is the injury. And so if we can say, okay, no, it's just the pain. So what, what that they care about, what that they value is being injured in this? Is it their sense of confidence? Is it their sense of contribution or belonging or any of these other things? So really, if we're afraid of emotion, we're not going to get to the root of issues. So one of the quotes that I love most from the book is facts don't solve fights. And we, we, and oh my goodness, through COVID, it was so painful watching Facebook be this place where people were like, you need to wear a mask. And this study says wear a mask. Well, my aunt was wearing a mask in a room and she's still like, okay, let's, let's stop throwing studies and facts at one another because what's happening is actually there's an injury being done to something we value, whether that's freedom or liberty or collective interest or whatever. So uh, I think if we fear emotions, um, we're never going to be good at productive conflict um, because facts don't solve fights. We got to get through the emotions down to what's the actual injury. And that's where we're going to have breakthroughs. So yeah, it's such an important topic. And another interesting thing I'm finding now is for a long time, I was trying to help people deal with if they saw emotion in the form of tears and how not to freak out and phone 911 if someone was crying. But interestingly, I think we've moved the needle on that a fair bit, 
But now what's interesting is we uh, we're very uncomfortable if someone yells. And I said, well, why is it if, if we're trying to get to a more humane workplace where emotions are part of the mix, why is it OK for one version of a hormonal override emotion to be tolerable and another one not to be? So now I'm and this is testy waters. I've done this with a few keynote audiences and they're like, Ooh. but. I do think it's an important question so that we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, it is an important question and uh, worthy of investigation and not shying away from. Yeah. And what I what I think that I got from the book, and I'd like to get into some of the like actual things that people can do, yeah. is you're you're there as a facilitator. I love when you would say like someone would get upset and you'd say, OK, now now we're on, this is good. Yeah, this is the good stuff. This is the good stuff. <laughs> now we're on to something. Yeah. This is important. Tell us why this is important. Yeah. And how you use these, these different layers of whether it's facts or emotions to get down to the values and to put them out what you call as truths, you know, yeah. that things that no one, like everyone agrees that, of course, we want our customers to feel taken care of. Everyone agrees we want, you know, people to be able to speak up at, or or work more productively or, you know, these yeah. things are not the issue. Yes. <laughs> and that when we get to that place of, of understanding and just that we have different ways of going about it according to our perspective or values or stakeholders yeah. or function. Yeah. That, that we, you know, we tend to put all of our attention in certain areas and forget about others. And that's why it's important that they're there to put that tension and attention on onto that rope that you, that we spoke about earlier. So what are some of, so in the service or the idea of we can all become the facilitator, that's why I feel like you're saying to us yeah. is you can learn these tools. I'm yeah. doing it here because yeah. that's my job, but <laughs> you can do this too. So what are some of the kinds of questions that we can ask when, when there's like stalemate or. Um, yeah. So let's tie the two together. Let's tie the emotions coming up and good questions. So I have three questions I really love if somebody's getting really emotional and you're like, Ooh, how do I help them kind of move through? So uh, one of the things we see is people get angry or frustrated or upset and they'll talk about all that's not working. If we did that, this would go wrong and this would go wrong, <laughs> right? And my favorite little tiny question, just what do you need? Because people will often tell us all that they hate and despise and and those sorts of things but not give us any clues about how we could make things better for them so that super short little question just what do you need and then the person often will sort of stop in their tracks when i use that question people are like oh that's an excellent question what do i need and then they start to take some ownership for you know oh okay i have to own my own emotions and and i need to do something so i love that one if the person is stuck in the past with a, an old grudge or resentment or whatever else, my favorite question then is, where from here? And I use that question all the time. Well, and then she said this, and then in 1992, we tried, <laughs> okay, where from here? And where from here is great because I'm not gonna fight with them about whether what they're saying and their grievance is true. I'm just gonna say, okay, if that, even if it is true, where are we going next? How do we get forward momentum? That's a good one. And if you get somebody who's in the but, well, but, 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 um, I love, okay, what do we still need to solve for? And so these short little questions and everybody listening can use these questions, sprinkle them into, and, and it really can be that easy. Um, just little ways of, of making people feel heard, making them feel acknowledged, but just that little hand on the back to just be like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's keep going. So, yeah. Um, so we have a question here from Kim. Isn't it kind to provide compassionate, honest, candid feedback? Uh, Kim, Kim, uh, Kim and I were, were talking on another post yesterday. Um, uh, yes, yes, it is. But here's the work that I've been doing lately. And this was the session I was doing with the accountancy yesterday. What most people think is feedback is only judgment. So we throw judgment at one another all the time. Your presentation was too rushed. Um, your work is sloppy. 
or even just, oh my God, you're so great. All of that is judgment. None of it is feedback. So uh, I think feedback, and so I'm going to define feedback as feedback is giving somebody novel information about the impact of their behavior on you. That's feedback. So there is nothing new or scary about uh, the other person's behavior in feedback. All of the novel information in feedback should be about you and your response. So the candor that Kim is talking about is I'm going to be vulnerable by telling you what story your behavior got me telling. Here's a great example. Uh, you're on a Zoom call and just as you start presenting, your colleague turns off their camera. <laughs> so what a lot of people would do is, you know, you were pretty disengaged this morning. That's judgment. But if I said, when I started my presentation, you turned off your camera, no new information for them there. I started telling myself a story that my presentation was boring. It kind of threw me off my game. I lost my mojo. That's the difference. So if we can learn to stop judging people, don't share your judgment of them, but instead translate from judgment into here was your objective behavior and here was how it impacted me. That candor is so generous. Um, it's so useful. Um, it's kind. Uh, it's amazing. But uh, the big problem is that most people think that what they're giving is feedback when really what they're giving is judgment. Yeah. Or at least opinion. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, and it, I love what you brought up about how we interpret things. Someone will do something and we have an interpretation of it. Yeah. It's and all we have. We're, we're, always, <laughs> we're always doing that. that that's what yeah. we do. And, and I think it's important for us to become aware that we are doing that so that we can be open to that. There can be different interpretations for the same. Yeah. So you alluded earlier to the two truths in chapter six, right? The two truths strategy is to not fight like we're on the last chair of musical chairs and there's only one thing that can be right, but instead to, to get to helping the other person articulate their truth. Um, mm. You know, for me, this is really about making sure our customers understand the new product. They're excited about it. Okay, great. So uh, I, I might go right to the whiteboard and write, okay, our customers need to understand and be excited about the launch. I can then add to that with my truth. My truth is I'm not even thinking about the customers yet. I don't think our sales force is yet excited or knowledgeable um, or ready to, to make a compelling case. So I know you're thinking about a customer event. I'm still back on thinking about, you know, how do we make sure our sales team is there? Both of those things can be true at the same time. Then all we're doing is algebra. We got, you know, your equation and my equation, and we got to solve for the unknown. All right, what, what's a plan that would allow us to take both of these truths into account? So that two truths strategy in the conflict strategies for nice people chapter uh, is, is a really important one. It really is. And <laughs> I, I feel like what you're talking about is like, what is true communication? Oh, I, I love <laughs> great prompt, Linda. Um, uh, so communication comes from the Latin commune to make common. And so here's the big problem. We think that we can communicate at people. So you send an email and you're like, okay, I've communicated that. Check. No, you haven't. <laughs> you have disseminated it. <laughs> you have transmitted it. You have no idea if it was received or what was received. So you can only communicate with someone. You cannot communicate to them or at them or any of these things that suggest unidirectionality. So conflict is about, and feedback, I, I talk about this, feedback is about two truths. So when you say in this morning's meeting, when you turned off your camera, I started feeling like my presentation wasn't interesting. That's only the first three steps. The final step is to say, what was going on? You know, what made you turn off your camera? Because I've given you my truth, but I still need to hear your truth. We've only communicated when we've kind of made comments. So great feedback is about getting both truths into the equation. So yeah, commu 
you can communicate at people. I have um, one of the fun things I got at the book launch was these great coasters for meeting rooms so that when you're in your meeting room and you pick up your coffee, you see the message. And one of them is, you know, you can't communicate at people. <laughs> I think we often try to communicate at people, not with them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think that everyone should, who, who avoids conflict or is, uncomfortable around it, needs to get the book and read all the suggestions that you have for different ways to engage in communication in different situations. And I know I'm going to be going back and studying up <laughs> because, I mean, it's, of course, as you know, it's relevant to companies and, and the meeting room, but it's also relevant to us in all of our lives because yeah, that's why I wrote that. It, try this at home chapter. Yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's everywhere. And, and the better we uh, communication speaking, I always say speaking is our human design. If we don't feel comfortable speaking somewhere, let's find out why and let's make a change. Yeah. So I thank you so much for helping us you know, look at conflict in this new way. I think that this is a great and growing edge for us as, you know, society. It's yeah. really, it's always been timely. It's really timely now. <laughs> it is. We so, need a lot more conflict where we're communicating with each other in our society right now. We've gone to our echo chambers and it's just a great example of where when we don't have conflict as a verb, something that we get through to the other side of, um, we're, I think we're suffering from that right now. So, so again, um, Leanne's book is called The Good Fight, and you can tell us where people can find you. Yeah, the best place to find me is just leannedavy.com or on LinkedIn. Those are the, I always say LinkedIn, I'm trying to make my LinkedIn comments the coolest couch on the internet if you want to talk about the most important um, workplace issues. So come hang out on my LinkedIn couch, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but leannedavy.com has, uh, I think now 600 articles, free resources, tools you can download. So if you're trying to apply this, um, leannedavy.com is where you're going to find all the good stuff. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on. My I think pleasure. I'm going to have you back. Time There's time so much more to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks everyone for coming on to this live stream of the Delight in the Limelight show. If you feel like you want to like capitalize and maximize your ability to speak up with focus and presence and groundedness, check out my free checklist of preparation rituals for speaking. You can get that at lindayugolo.com forward slash rituals. And next week, I have two live streams coming up, one with Susie DeVille, author of Buoyant, about how to feel freer in your self-expression so that you can enjoy the work you do. And on Wednesday, Howard Glasser of the Nurtured Heart Approach. I don't know if you've heard of him. He has had a huge impact on my life. I can't believe I get to interview him We'll be talking about psychological safety and how to bring out the greatness in other people, including yourself. So if you like this show, be sure to subscribe. Come to our live show streams next week. And in the meantime, wishing you delight in the limelight.